In this video, I'll discuss the 6 most important programming language types. Starting with this video, I will have a table of contents at the beginning, so you will know from the first couple of seconds whether you want to keep watching. So here's what I'll discuss. First, what types of classifications of languages I came across. Then I will go over the possible ways of classifying languages. Finally, I'll show you the one that I settled on. And I'll go over the individual categories with an example language for each category. For each language, I'll tell you if I think it's worth learning and for who. While I was doing research for this video, I came across a couple of ways to classify languages. The one you would find on Wikipedia would be based on paradigms. If you went by that definition, you would get something like this. While this classification is decent, I think it can be a little bit better in terms of representing the relationships between these paradigms. A lot of these paradigms have a lot in common with each other, but it isn't really expressed here. I finally set it on the classification represented by a graph. It focuses on one of the most important parts of a language, which is how it represents state. Also, the idea behind this graph and the graph itself was created by Peter Van Roy, so the credit for that goes to him. This graph separates languages by how declarative they are. Related to it, it also shows you how they handle state. There are a lot of other ways of separating languages. You could separate them by how much it supports generic programming or concurrency. State is just the most useful divider, in my opinion. This graph also divides languages into three categories. A name state, name state, and languages that support non-deterministic state. If I generalize a little bit, I would say that most popular languages are on the right of this graph, with the exception of SQL. This graph also shows with what thinking uh, certain languages were constructed. The thought process of the languages on the left is more or less opposite on, to the ones on the right. It also tells us about the history of languages. You can see from the top how they started out and how they specialized more and more at the bottom. By this definition, or by this graph, SQL would more or less be the opposite of C, at least in terms of how it expresses state. And this is how the declarativeness of SQL works. You say what the result should look like, but not how to actually calculate it. You tell SQL the properties of the result and it returns data based on the properties. This is a very pure form of declarative programming. But in an imperative language like C, the thought process is reversed. You don't want to think about what the language will give you first, but how it will calculate what you want it to do. I will start off with the most declarative language types and make my way down to the least declarative types of languages. So the first group is unnamed state languages. These are considered the most declarative. You describe what the problem should look like and not how to compute it. That's what makes this category different. Two subgroups of unnamed state languages are logic and constraint programming and functional programming. Logic and constraint programming is about telling the compiler facts about data and using the relations between those facts to solve problems. To explain it quickly, it's about rules and facts and using queries to extract information from it. I'll be a bit more specific when I explain in Prolog. They are usually untyped, which means that they either don't have types or there is only one type. This type of language is pretty useful for things that are about retrieving data in general. It's pretty useless for things that need specific implementation details. Prolog is a perfect example of this paradigm. In order to actually use Prolog, you need a Prolog implementation. Prolog SWI is pretty popular. The syntax is pretty similar to what I've shown. It's very concise because you don't have to be explicit with these languages. They usually don't require you to write any boilerplate. Declarative languages as a whole don't have much boilerplate. Use swprolog with typing the sweeple command. Then you have to load some rules from a file. For this example, I described Amsterdam and where people are. You can read the first line as Amsterdam is a city. The second line means a city is a settlement. And the final line means that settlements have people. I saved this logic into a file called city.pl. Even from this simple example, you can probably see how you can store some pretty complex logic. You load the file with sweeple city.pl. You can now ask the compiler questions about the facts that you just described. I want to know whether Amsterdam has people, so I ask this question, and I get true as a result. I can also ask about things that don't have any relations at all. For example, I can ask if the sun has any people, and I get false. The main use case is AI and storing logic. It's more of a special use case language, but I recommend trying it if you're interested. It's more for learning since the time investment isn't that extreme. I've already made a video on functional programming, but I'll quickly summarize what it is. FP is a paradigm about composing a program entirely of functions, but not of normal functions. They're composed of pure, also called mathematical functions. These functions have no side effects, which means all they do is take into the input value 
do some computation on it or process it somehow and then return it. What you aren't allowed to do in these functions is for example to take in a value, compute it, but also print to the standard output. That would be a side effect. Haskell is probably the most popular implementation of FP. The syntax is very different from languages with C-like syntax, which are most modern languages. There really aren't variables in Haskell, only functions. But those functions can return a static value, making them more or less constants. The core of Haskell is obviously functions, which are declared like so. I would recommend learning FP if you want to try programming in a completely different way if you're used to OP. I would definitely also recommend it after you've learned the mainstream paradigms, since it's more niche. The next category are languages which are in between, also known as non-deterministic state languages. This category is a bit unique and for that reason I will only go into the example of the language to showcase what I mean. With a couple of exceptions, these languages really aren't that popular. In fact, the only real example with decent documentation that I could find was Oz. The reason Oz is in this category is because it supports non-deterministic programming. And I should probably explain first what non-deterministic programming is. Non-deterministic programming means the ability for the program to specify its own alternatives in the program flow. But it's not even close to the way uh, say C does program flow. These modifications are not specified by the programmer, but rather the compiler. The compiler decides which of these alternatives the program will take. I'll call it ND programming from now because the name is too long. Also without ND programming is actually fairly understandable. It reminds me of Lua. But I want to talk about ND, so here's how OS implements it. For ND, the most important thing is the this keyword. Use it to specify that the compiler would need to make a choice at this point. But simply put, ND is just runtime control flow that the developer gives over control to the compiler. I personally don't plan on fully learning this language anytime soon, but if the idea of ND programming is interesting to you, you could learn it. But for most developers, I don't think it's really that necessary. These are the languages that are considered very imperative. You explicitly specify how you want to compute your results. The three categories are data flow and message passing, message oriented programming and shared state OOP. These are the most common languages and the ones on the right generally have the most required boilerplate. In normal programming languages, which are also called control flow languages, you have instructions that operate on data. Whereas in data flow languages, you have data that is given to instructions. This is the main difference between normal programming and data flow programming. Message passing is just the ability for certain components of the program to send messages to each other. OCaml is a good example of the latter. This is an ADT imperative language. What this means is that the dev has more control over the underlying logic and this language supports algebraic data types. Now let me explain what an ADT is. ADT is the data type that is a composite. This means that it's made up of other data types. An example from the OCaml book could be a point which is just two floats. There are also some types which are very similar to enums. Other than that, OCaml is actually not far off of pr functional programming and it, it is a bit of an outlier on the right category. It's a language that I would try if you like functional programming. Message parsing is similar to OOP but with an emphasis on messages rather than classes. This paradigm is about sending messages between actors and making those actors react based on those messages. For example, from a high level perspective you could encode this logic. You would have 5 actors A, B, C and D and you can tell the actors to do something when they receive a signal. This reactivity is the basis of message parsing programming. Then the actual sequence could be like this. The main thing to note here is the independence of these actors. They react only on what signals they receive and they don't really do anything else. It's a bit strange for Erlang to be next to OP, considering it is very close to functional programming. But the way it handles messages forces it to be in this category. It allows you to send messages between actors and this isn't allowed in FP. But syntax-wise, it isn't really all that different from Haskell. You compose the functions with this syntax. Then you put the file into a module. As a basic syntax overview, this is enough and I would recommend Erlang if you already tried prior FP and want to try a slightly different, less strict functional language. OOP is the paradigm that has the greatest emphasis on state. Specifically, state inside of objects. Whereas the main feature in FP is functions, here it is classes. Whereas FP tries to avoid side effects, OOP embraces them. 
OOP is side effects. I should note that for this example, I use the modern OOP definition and not the older, more message parsing definition of it, which I discussed in a different video. You could call this category class-based OOP and the message parsing category message-based OOP. Java is an example of a OOP language generally taught at universities to teach the paradigm, so I will use it as well. Java forces you to place everything inside of a class, and this is its most significant feature. It also enforces that most problems are handled via classes and not, for example, with namespaces with functions. It's technically not pure OOP because not everything is an object, but it's close enough for this example. You can see from the dreaded hello world program in Java that the language is very strict on enforcing OOP. There have been attempts to make programs like these simpler, so the version in Java 21 is a lot shorter to write. Other than the OOP, Java has C-like syntax, so the syntax isn't too difficult to learn for most developers. I think Java is a language that's mostly used at big companies, and much less for solo developer projects. If you want to learn OOP, it is not a bad idea to learn Java. That's it, I hope you got something from the video. Subscribe and like if you want to see more.